Well, we're starting a new message series, a new sermon series today, and we're calling it The Church Defined. An alternative title that we, that we debated using was The Church After COVID, <laughs> right? Because, <laughs> well, yeah, what a year. Uh, just over a year ago, in, in just two weeks, we went from aware that this COVID-19 thing might become an issue to, bam, having to shut down all in-person services and gatherings. I mean, you guys remember that? That was crazy. Crazy. And, and shutting down church and interrupting everything that's our regular rhythms, it prompted a lot of questions. Oh my goodness, what is this all about? Are we okay? Uh, a lot of questions about church. When are we going to meet again? Can we be the church without in-person services? Right? It's been, it's been a year of questions in a lot of aspects of our life, really about every arena of life. COVID-19 in this past year has prompted us to ask questions. And that's natural when things change. Because times of change, when things interrupt our life, it, those prompt us to, to look at life differently and, and to kind of see it with fresh eyes. And, to, and it prompts us to ask questions that we, in the regular course of life, might not even think to ask. That's true of all of the arenas of our life, right? Work, the arena of work, all these questions. We're seeing work through different lenses. We're, we're asking questions about work and the nature of work uh, that we wouldn't have thought to ask before COVID-19. Relationships, family, our leisure time, all these arenas of life, we're kind of seeing it with fresh eyes, we're asking questions that are good questions to ask. And, and the, the arena of church is no different. It can sometimes feel wrong to be asking questions about church, but in fact, it's completely normal and can be very healthy as long as we let God and his word answer the questions, right? That's what makes asking questions healthy. Well, in this message series, we're going to be asking some questions about the church together, and we're going to be going to the Bible to get our answers. Now, today, I'm going to be answering the question, what is the church anyway, and why does it matter? It's a good question. It's a very big picture. Uh, next week, Tony's going to be addressing a very COVID-specific question about the church. Is online church real church? Anybody kind of ask that question? Well, we're going to ask it and try to answer it next week. But after that, we, we want this sermon series to be as helpful to all of us as possible. So although the preaching team has kind of come up with a bunch of questions that are all good, we want to make sure we're hearing questions from everybody. So we'd love to get your questions. I can't promise we'll answer everyone, but we'd love to kind of see the questions that, that all of us are asking. So the way to get those to us is the app or the website. All right, just go on the website, go on the app, and you can kind of submit questions, and we'll be taking those questions and, and, and working to answer them in the weeks ahead. Well, today, I'm going to try to tackle the question, what is the church anyway, and why does it matter and uh, it's a big, it, those are really two questions <laughs> as I was working. A teaching team, we wrote that down and I was preparing the message. Like, that, that's not fair. I got two. I got to do a two for one, but uh, I'm excited. Uh, what is the church anyway? Let's kind of take them one at a time. Let's start with that first one. What is the church anyway? And let's go to God's word. I want to start in uh, Acts chapter two. It's right where the church post Jesus, the the, the New Testament church that we're still a part of 2,000 years later, it's, the, it's where it started, the day of Pentecost. And here's what's happened. It's been 50 days since Jesus' death and resurrection. Right, for 40 days, Jesus was, was appearing to his disciples and, and, and proving that he was risen and showing them in the scriptures how he fulfilled all of them. And then they watched, 10 days earlier, they watched Jesus ascend into heaven. And now they've been waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. And on the Sunday and the day of Pentecost, in an upper room, a small group of 120 followers of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descended and indwelt them. And, and it was crazy. They ran out into the crowded streets of Jerusalem, 
And Jerusalem was really crowded because Pentecost is a feast today, and, and all Jews, wherever they lived, were commanded to come back to Jerusalem. So all of these Jews that from all over the Middle East packed into the city, and now this group of followers of Yeshua come running out, speaking in languages that they didn't know, but the foreign Jews understood in their own language about how Jesus is the Messiah. A huge crowd gathers. Peter begins to tell them about Jesus, and we pick up the story in, uh, in Acts chapter 2, beginning, let's see, where do we want to begin? I wrote it in my notes here somewhere. Oh yeah, 37, verse 37. Paul sa- uh, Peter is preaching, he says, it describes this now, when the crowd heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I see three things in this in this account of the first birth of the New Testament church that helps us understand and answer the question, what is church anyway? See, this this entire story here is is about people, right? They did this, they did this. The first characteristic of the church that I see in Acts chapter 2 is it's all about people. The church is people. Might, that might seem kind of obvious, like, yeah, of course, Scott, duh. But I think it's important to state the obvious because a lot of times when we talk about church, we aren't talking about people, right? When we talk about church, we're talking about a place or, or activities. We were discussing this in our, in our teaching team the other day, and Eric Knight, who leads our campus ministries, he was sharing a story of when he and his wife, Joy, had moved to a new, a new town, and they were looking to find a church and they visited this church and enjoyed it and afterwards they were talking with one of the members of the church and they said we really enjoyed the service we'd really like to get to know more about your church and the lady said well it's really not that big of a building you can just kind of walk around right now and check it out for yourself right and I chuckled when I heard that story and then I thought yeah I could totally see myself answering somebody that way right because When we talk about church, a lot of times we're not talking about people. We're talking about the building, the activities, the leadership, other aspects. But the church is about people. And it's not just about any people. It's about a particular type of person, of people. People who have one thing in common and only one thing that matters. They're redeemed by Christ. People redeemed by Christ. Did you see that in this story? That's the commonality. They were from all over the place. They, they, they spoke all these different languages, but when they heard the message that salvation could be found in Jesus Christ, they repented and trusted Christ and were redeemed and sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's what had them, that's what they had in common. It's interesting that the the Greek word that in the New Testament is translated church, the vast majority of times in English you read the word 
church. You're, behind it is this Greek word, ekklesia. Ekklesia. And literally it means the called out people. The called out people. If you want to, it's not a religious term in the Greek. Uh, it had been around for hundreds of years, uh, mostly kind of used in the, in the context, context of an assembly, uh, often for political purposes. Uh, but, but the term was grabbed by the writers of the New Testament who were inspired by, by God to, 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 to refer to them as a people called out, which implies a commonality. They, they were called out, and what they have in common is their calling. They have their calling in common. Jesus used the word when he said to Peter, uh, before he died, he said to Peter, who had just declared that you're the Christ, to, to Jesus, and Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my called out people, my ecclesia, my church. The church is people who have been redeemed by Christ, called out by him. But there's one more aspect that's all over this, this glimpse into the first days of the church. They're not just people who have one thing in common, and that's it. It's not, it's not just kind of a, we have this in common, we, we, we share a, a faith in Christ. No, they have community in common. They're living in biblical community together. The picture of the church that we see in Acts 2 and throughout the New Testament is is not just a picture of people who share a a belief and a trust in Jesus Christ. We everywhere in the New Testament see a picture of people who share a trust in Jesus Christ, but who then live in community together, biblical community, practices, characteristics that, that together comprise what we call biblical community. See, biblical community centers on God's word. Community that's built around God's word, knowing it, applying it. Biblical community involves knowing and being known. It's not anonymous. Biblical community involves supporting others in the community and being supported. It involves encouraging and being encouraged. Biblical community is not you know, random. It's, it's, it has organization. Biblical community has accountability. It has leadership. And and here's the thing in the New Testament, you see, biblical community involves everyone. Everyone's an active member of biblical community. So, the definition of church that I pull out of Acts chapter 2 is, is this straightforward. People redeemed by Christ in biblical community together. That is a great working definition of the local church. I hope it's a definition of change point as a church family. We're people redeemed by Christ in biblical community together. Now, the Bible, when it uses the term ecclesia, though, doesn't always just refer to a local church. There are times in the Bible where the word church is used referring to Christians in a whole region, or even all Christians anywhere around the globe. And so there's a there's a little bit different definition for what we call the universal church, the church of Christ globally. And it has to do with that last component of biblical community because I have community with a Christian on the other side of the planet in one sense. I mean, I can go on a vacation to Mexico, meet another Christian from you know, some other country, Japan, and instantly there's community. You guys ever experienced that? Just total random stranger, but when you kind of discover you both are people who've been redeemed by Christ, bam, there's this connection, there's this community. But it's not the kind of community that, that you engage in a local ecclesia family with, right? There's a limit to knowing and being known, to encouraging and being encouraged, right? Supporting and being, accountability isn't there. Leadership, they have different leaders than, than I would. So, so the, the, the definition for the universal church, I would write it this way, the community of people redeemed by Christ. A little bit different, uh, and the difference has to do with the degree and extent of biblical community. So that's a little bit from the word, from Acts chapter 2, helping answer the question, what is the church? 
And if you could summarize it in one word, I'd say it's this. The church is people. The church is people. It's so obvious, and yet I forget it. Right? I'm responsible for so many organizational things in this church family that I sometimes can't see the people through all the organization. Right? All the kind of things that have to get done and decisions that have to be made. The church is a people thing. That's one of the reasons why we like to use the term family here at Change Point. We often refer to Change Point family. Hopefully just us culturally as, as a church using the term family will help remind me and all of us the church is a people thing. It's a people thing. Redeemed by Christ, living in biblical community together. You know, I was thinking as I was in this passage and thinking about the church being a people thing, it reminded me of a, I don't know, about maybe 10 years ago, there was kind of this popular, not very popular, but somewhat, it was, got some notoriety, this particular saying. It showed up in Facebook and People had it on t-shirts and it would say, Jesus, yes. Church, no. Right? Kind of kind of catchy. Jesus, yes. Church, no. Man, that is not biblical. If, if the t-shirt said, Jesus, yes. People, no. I don't think it would have gotten any traction. Right? The church is people. You can't say yes to to Jesus and no to the ecclesia, it's, it's, it doesn't compute. And yet Satan has had so much success getting us to kind of think that you can say Jesus yes, church no, and you know there's some truth there. No, there's no truth there. There's reality that the church is full of broken people, which can be quite frustrating and sometimes sometimes flat-out abusive, right? That's reality, but you can't say no to the church. It's the people of God. We're going to talk about that a bit more as we get to this second question. Why does church matter? Why does church matter? Why should you and I say yes to the church? That's a fair question. I want to give you three reasons. There are others, but these are three of the biggest. I find the first one in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus. Chapter 1, Paul writes this. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. By the way, Paul writes long sentences. Okay, so just stay with me here. Stay with Paul here. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints... I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and, and dominion and above every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the called out people, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Wow. The first reason to say yes to the church is because the church is God's plan. The church is God's plan and it's not just a part of god's plan like god has a bigger plan but church kind of is a place no the church is god's plan did you notice paul's words there after that enormously long sentence talking about god's plan to elevate jesus and give him dominion he says it all comes to fruition in the church which is the body of christ 
the fullness, the, get this, the church is the fullness, Paul says, of him who fills all in all. The church, the people that Christ has redeemed, is the fullness of him who fills all in all. There's no other plan. The church isn't a part of God's plan. The church is God's plan. We need to say yes to it, despite its flaws, because of its flaws. It's, according to the Bible, it is impossible to say yes to Jesus and no to the church, to the people. It just, it, you can't do it. To say yes to Jesus means you say yes to his body, to the church. Listen to how Paul emphasizes the, uh, the link between Jesus and his church as he finishes the, the book of, of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, right at the very end, Ephesians 3. Now, this is his last statement. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him, get this, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. The glory of God is in, in, inextricably connected to his people. God is glorified as he's glorified in and through us. We we hold the glory of God in our hands. It's his plan. I don't know why he did it that way. I mean, I wouldn't if I was God, but he did. What a privilege. What a calling. We need to say yes to the church, to the people of God that Christ is called. Well, second reason to say yes to the church. The second reason the church matters. I'll go over to Paul's First letter to the Corinthians. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12. Paul writes, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Second reason that church matters is because we need each other. We need each other. There are no Lone Ranger Christians in the Bible. Never. There are, you know, that, that's one of the things about America's greatness that cuts against God's truth. We're great in part because we, we, we love to just get up and go and go it alone and pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And we can accomplish a lot on this earth in this earthly life that way but not spiritually, and not in the ways that really matter. The Bible has no lone ranger followers of Christ. We need each other. We need to bear each other's burdens. The Bible says that in the ecclesia, we bear each other's burdens. It says we build each other up, right? We spur each other on. These are all phrases that the Bible uses to describe the body of Christ us working and living together in biblical community. And it doesn't matter what stage of life we're in. We need each other. When we're young, middle-aged, old students, you know, you, I know that you want to thrive in your teen years. Let me tell you something. You need the church 
to thrive spiritually the way God wants you to thrive and you want to thrive. You need the community of followers of Christ. New parents, you want to be awesome parents to your child. You need biblical community to be the awesome parents that you want to be. Some of you are retired. You're moving into that retirement stage, and you want it to count. You want your, your golden years to be golden. You need the community of followers of Jesus to help you have a retirement stage of life that produces more fruit in your family with your loved ones and in the kingdom of God than, than you've ever been able to do. You now have the resources and the experience and wisdom to do that in the context of community and only in the context of family. We need to say yes to the church because we need each other. Third and final reason I'll give you to say yes to the church, a reason that church matters. Matthew Matthew 5. This is now Jesus. Matthew 5. Jesus says, he's talking to his disciples, you, this is actually a sermon on the mount, so it's quite a, quite a crowd. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Third reason church matters is because the world needs to see Jesus. Family, if you haven't noticed, we live in a world that's desperately dark and it that probably isn't but it feels sometimes like it's getting darker does it feel that way at times yeah i don't know if it's getting darker it just is dark maybe it's just the older i get the more i realize how how lost people are without jesus how dark spiritually their world is. The world needs the light of Jesus. And here's the truth of the Bible. The only way the light of Jesus can ever shine is through his called out ones. That's it. It's God's only plan. You know, for many years I, I read these words of Jesus and I applied them individually. Like I'd read them, Scott, you are the light of the world. Scott, you need to let your light shine. Individually applied it. And there's some health in doing that, but that's not actually what Jesus said. You see, in Greek, the word that's translated you, which in English sounds very singular, very individual, you, 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 you. It, there's a plural form of that in the Greek, and that's the word that Jesus has used. It's like he, if there was a southern version of the Bible... Right? If it was like translated by somebody in North Carolina, they would be excited to put in Jesus' words, y'all. Y'all are the light of the world. I've never lived this, well, I briefly lived in the South. But, yeah, they, there's probably actually, when he gets to the second time he used it, they'd probably pr translate it, all y'all. Right? Y'all are the light of the world, and all y'all need to let your light shine. Seriously, that's the, that's, because again, there's no singular use of the, of the church family. The word ecclesia is a plural word. The you Jesus uses here, and in most places he's talking, is plural. This is something we do together. Now, why does that even matter? I was thinking about that, and I made me think of my headlamp. Now, I, when it comes to my hunting gear, my outdoor gear, I'm a fanatic, right? There's nothing more enjoyable than spending hours researching everything about the headlamps. And I buy the best one, and next year, there's a better one. How awesome is that? Now, headlamps, if those of you that know, headlamps are all about one thing. Lumens, baby. How many lumens? Candle power. 
right? That's what headlamps are all about. And the difference between the brightest headlamps and kind of your average one are stunning. I mean, you put on a, a normal headlamp, on, you know, you put the normal headlamp on, it's kind of an average one, and you go outside, you can hardly see 10 feet away. Kind of bare, you can look at your feet and not trip over a root, but that's about it. But you put on a bright one, the, the best ones, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blinding you guys in the front row there. Uh, hey, camera, here we go. I tell you, this, this will light up a tree at 300 yards, right? This is, all, it's a lot of candle power. And here's what made me think of it. You know, individually, all of us do have a candle. We have a light. But the world can't see my candle from very far away by itself. It can't. I, I mean, I can kind of, I can, you know, if somebody comes really close to me, they can walk right there and we won't trip over roots. But the folks in darkness, a little bit farther away, they're not going to see my light, one little candle. But together, as we come together, that's candle power. Candle power. Combined candle power. And when Christians come together in the family, the light can shine as far into the darkness as it's needed by the Holy Spirit to go rescue somebody and bring him or her into the light. And we experience that as a church family all the time. We're experiencing it right now in a kind of fresh and exciting way. Three years ago, let me start with this. We have a vision that's statewide, and Alaska is a big state. Life in Christ for every Alaskan, right? And three years ago, how exciting. When we pulled our candles together and launched our Promised Land initiative and were able to plant campuses beyond Raspberry, that was combined candle power, and our our lights are shining into places that they weren't able to reach before. Kotzebue, we have a, a, a campus in Kotzebue. The Change Point family's combined spiritual candle power is shining the light of Jesus into the Kotzebue region for three years now. But there's still a lot more state. There's still a lot more state to reach, right? Here we are in Anchorage, Kotzebue, which gets me to the village of Marshall on the lower Yukon River. We got a call about, I don't know, it was probably September, from an organization called Samaritan's Purse. It's a large Christian uh, ministry, operates all around the globe, but it has a particular passion to see churches, healthy churches in rural Alaska. And 10 years ago, uh, Samaritan's Purse built a church facility in the village of Marshall. Got a picture of it coming up here. So here's the church that they built. It's a church building and two parsonages. Right, so that ministers could live there and, and minister in Marshall and in the villages down, up and down the lower Yukon. That was 10 years ago they built this. It's been empty for years now. And it's, and it's just deeply grieving Samaritan's Purse's leadership. But they've seen what God's been doing through all of us in beginning to, to shine the light out into places outside the road system. And they've noticed Change Point Kotzebue. They know Lance, and so they called us and said, hey, we'd like to talk to Lance about, and to all of you about possibly extending your ministry, shining your light to the village of Marshall and that part of Alaska. Now, we, went, we took a trip. Lance went down. I got a picture of him in the church. I mean, it looks like he's a natural there, right? And by the way, Marshall was heavy locked down in October because of concerns about COVID, but we got in. We met some of the local uh, followers of Christ there that are longing to see a church recreated there. Lance started getting really excited, started to see how his online ministry, and he's been quite frustrated in COVID not to be able to meet in person. They still can't meet in person up in Kotzebue. But Lance has, has learned how to do ministry virtually. And you see, I, he can do ministry in Marshall, leveraging this online ministry that God's been asking him to do this last year. He started getting really a, a sense of passion for the people and the ministry there in that part of, of Alaska. God it, it led us to a, a couple, John and Margaret Lewis, who have been ministering and living in Marshall for a number of years, aren't there now, and they don't have the housing they need to get back there. And they love to disciple, but they're not a preacher. John's not a preacher, but oh my goodness, them there with Lance partnered up, 
So God's from passion, he's given passion, he's confirmed people. It was that third P, the provision, the dollars and cents that we were struggling with because we've got an empty warehouse through this wall here. We're missing you know, $80,000 a month in income. It's like, God, how, why are you giving us passion and people without the provision? And Samaritans first said to us, well, if that's your only problem, we don't have people, but we could fund this for, say, the next three years. Would that help? We said, you know what? That would help. That would help. So in the middle of a pandemic, the candle, the combined candle power of this church family is now, it's been beamed to Kotzebue, and now from Kotzebue, it's beaming on to Marshall. Because we're combining our lumens. That's what we can do together. The reason... The third reason to say yes to the church and to fully engage with the people of God is because together we can show the world the light of Jesus in a way we could never do individually. Does the church matter? Yeah, it does. God's glory is at stake. You know, some of you, I'll just give you a little opportunity for showing up today, I'll, I'll give you this opportunity because I think the seats will go fast. We're taking some work teams down to freshen up the building there in Marshall in May. So three weeks in a row, bam, bam, first three weeks in May, we're taking work teams. You don't need to bring, don't have to pay for anything, you don't need to bring anything, just yourself, skilled is good uh, if you got some construction skills, but we just need a lot of cleaning and painting. Uh, so... You can sign up right now for one of these uh, at, at our, on our website, changepointalaska.com and forward slash Marshall. And it's going to be exciting to start bringing back the reports. I think, I believe in these three weeks, well, not only will we, we be able to have a lot of fun getting that facility retuned up and ready for ministry, I'll bet you God gives us those teams the opportunity to do real ministry. It's a small community. We're going to meet people in May. You guys excited about Marshall? This is just awesome. Yeah. All right, pastor's challenge. I've run a little long today. Here's my pastor's challenge. Say yes to church. Say yes to church. Now, I'm not asking, those of you online, it's, you're not feeling safe yet uh, to, to re-engage in person. I'm not asking you to take a risk. I, I'm just saying wherever we are, we might get a second wave of COVID. Who knows what's going to happen? But the church is never shut down because it's not a place or a set of activities. The church is people. So when I say say yes to the church, I'm not saying show up here or I'm saying engage with the people of God. Engage with the people of God fully in all the ways that that works for you. Don't leave any just kind of on the shelf. I mean, practically, what does that mean? Well, engage in the services, right? Weekly, weekly times of in the word and, and, and praise. Engage in other ways. I tell you, one of the best ways to engage in the family is just to find a place you can contribute your time your, and your abilities. Uh, Adventure Land, our children's ministry, our student ministries, uh, the ministries that help the homeless, the the food bank, all these different ministries, there's a place for every one of us. Jump in. In fact, the worship team, some of you can sing, play instruments, or can run tech. Worship team is having auditions this week. Jump in. Engage fully with your ecclesia, your local church family. It'll be to God's glory, but I promise you, it'll be to your and my joy as well. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for your word the way it challenges us. Help us shine the light of Jesus into every dark place that you'd want to use this family to reach, Father. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.